Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Arthur O'Dwyer, uh, and this is the first of my two talks. Uh, I hope after you come to this one, you will come to my other talk, which I promise will be even better than this one. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to advertise it at two points during this talk. So if we, get, if, if we pass one of those two points, and I didn't advertise the talk, just let me know. So you forgot to advertise that other talk. Um, all right, so this talk is called An Allocator is a Handle to a Heap. Um, this is a mantra that I have been trying to uh, establish for the past six months to a year. Um, because uh, it, it occurred to me in looking at the new stuff that we got in C++17, uh, one of the big new features is the memory resource header, uh, which has a bunch of stuff that we're going to be seeing during this talk. And one of its most salient features is it has this thing called polymorphic allocator, which is a basically a pointer to a memory resource. Um, and looking at this has convinced me, at least, that this is true of all allocator types. An allocator is, fundamentally, a, a handle to a heap. Um, and I am going to attempt to convince you of that. Uh, so that was a little spoiler trailer for the entire talk. Um, so uh, by the way, there are slide numbers down there. Um, so if you have a question on a particular slide, um, and you want to come back to it later, uh, you can always jot down the slide number, and then we can go back and look at that slide again. Um, speaking of, of having questions about things, uh, I encourage you to ask questions during this talk. Um, just, uh, just stretch it out. Um, so if there's a, a question or an argument you want to have, uh, by all means, uh, shout it out. Um, I will endeavor to repeat questions, and I reserve the right to steamroll over any questions that are leading us in a direction that would not line up with the rest of the slides. Um, so uh, yeah, let's start with stuff about objects and values. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about, well, maybe not a lot. There are people who have thought more than me about objects and values in terms of programming, in terms of C++ specifically. Um, now, the term object has a particular meaning in the C++ standard. In the standard ease, you know, an object is, I think, a region of storage um, that has maybe a lifetime and so on. But um, I'm talking in more the platonic sense, where we have this division between pure platonic values, like the value 42, or hello world, or Wednesday, um, where it doesn't, really have a it doesn't necessarily have a representation or a region of storage associated with 42 or Wednesday. Those are just abstract values that we are then going to represent in some matter in the computer. Um, and we can represent 42. Um, well, let's not talk about representation yet. That was a value. Let's talk about objects. Objects are things with specific regions of storage associated with them um, permanently. An object is identified by its address. Um, by pointer, by the name of the object, by some unique identifier or handle. All of these things are synonymous for our purposes that I have an object, object A, and it's identified as, well, it's object A. Its value might change. Its state might change. It might not even have meaningful, um, like A value, but it might have some state variables, some data members that get mutated. Um, but it itself, that object, will always live at a certain address or a certain identifier. We might, it might not be a literal uh, address in the underlying machine. It might be some sort of uh, content address storage, and it's identified by some particular hash. And it, but it's still got an identifier associated with it. It's that thing. Um, an object is a thing. And you notice I have some objects here. I have object A and B. Those are just ints, and they have values. Whoops. I said objects have values, and it just shut down on me, because that's <laughs> not true. Uh, I, I, we say objects have values. I say objects have values. I haven't really quite figured out what I want to say instead. Right? Because there are some kinds of objects, like this widget over here, it doesn't have a value, really. There's no, it might not have a way to print its value, and it might not have a way to compare its value. And that might just be because it doesn't really have a value. Uh, you know, it, it's a, a really object-oriented kind of thing. If we have a, a shape or a car, it might not have a value, necessarily. Um, but in some sense, when I say b, and b is of type int, and it has these four bytes that represent 42, somehow I, I understand that that is the value of the object. And I haven't really figured out how to think about that yet. Um, and then important, I already mentioned this, but the, uh, the name of an object, the identifier of an object, is itself a value. Right? So um, 
the way I've seen this explained before is uh, I, Arthur, am an object. I have a particular body, and its state may change from time to time. Um, but it's always Arthur without quotes around it. But I also have a name, which is Arthur with quotes around it. Um, and that is a value. I, I can write that down and give it to someone else. I can make copies of the name Arthur. I can't make copies of the actual Arthur. Um, if I could, I would have more talks. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the name of the object is itself a value. And so, for example, in C++, we see that pointers, uh, you can talk about a pointer value, and people do know what you mean by that, because a pointer identifies an object, but a pointer itself is a value. Um, so uh, where it gets confusing, I've, sorry, I've already skipped ahead a little bit, um, is that a C++ object is defined in part by its in-memory representation. Um, and so there's a sense in which an object of type int can have the value 42, have in quotes. I don't really know what that means. Um, but the value 42 as the platonic value can also be represented in several different ways. I can, have, I can put it into four bytes. I can also put it into eight bytes. And I can put it into eight bytes in several different ways, depending on whether it's floating point or, or a non-floating point or uh, big endian, little endian. There are all these sort of different things that go into a C++ type um, that we don't think about in the platonic world where we just have 42. And I write 42 in my source code. And I, you know, it will get implicitly converted to whatever particular type it needs to be. Um, so right, we have two different representations of the same value. Um, instead of saying the object has a value, we should really say the object state is such and such. Um, because objects, values can copy. We can make copies of values. We can compare values. Objects don't really copy and compare. Objects, in the object-oriented sense, might have a method named compare that looks at the state and compares it to some other object state. And it might have a method named clone that makes a new object whose state is in some way related to the previous object state, but that's not really a copy in the like Stepanov sense. Um, typically, I, I want to try to really separate value types from object types. Um, unfortunately, that gets tricky because it's C++. Um, and so we have two ways of looking at a lot of things. We can look at a container, for example, as a value, um, such as the list. 10, 20, contains two subvalues, 10 and 20. And we can talk about these things in the platonic sense, and we don't necessarily need to have it uh, represented in memory in any particular way. Um, and we can talk about copying and comparing vectors by value. Um, but we can also think of it as an object that holds and manages elements which themselves are also objects with particular addresses and, and uh, so on. Um, and so there are two ways of looking at it. Um, and on this slide, there are mysterious symbols on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, there's that box and that arrow, um, and it, the arrow is pointing at these other boxes. It's not really clear where they came from. Uh, there's much less mystery, mysterious symbols on the left-hand side because there are no symbols on the left-hand side. It's all platonic, just clouds. Um, once we start talking about boxes instead of clouds, we have all these questions uh, like, where does that memory come from? Uh, what is the thing represented by the box and the arrow? Um, and probably some other questions too. And uh, who answers these questions? The, an the answer of these questions is the C++ allocator model. So we're going, we're going to answer these with the allocator. So each container in the standard library is parameterized uh, on T, its value type, and also on the allocator type, A. Um, and the allocator is in charge of answering all those questions that we saw in the previous slide. Um, most of which are related to the object representation or the object-ness of, of this. Uh, where does the memory come from? It comes from the allocate uh, member function of the allocator. Uh, what is the thing represented by this little arrow in our diagram? Uh, it is a pointer, uh, but it is not necessarily a machine pointer. It's just an object of type pointer as defined again by the allocator type. The allocator type is answering all our questions. Um, and in particular, not just the allocator type, but the container itself will actually hold an instance of the allocator type A within itself. So the vector will actually have a field inside itself, which is its allocator, and it will use that allocator, um, not just the allocator type A, but that specific allocator inside itself uh, for all the questions it needs answered. Uh, anything that can be funneled through that instance, obviously you can't funnel the pointer type def through that one instance because you can't change the meaning of a type def at runtime. Uh, but anything that can be funneled through at runtime is funneled. 
So this raises the question of what can we put inside an allocator instance? Um, and this is a question that the old standards up to 17 did not really give us any uh, guidance on. Um, because the only allocator type in 03, 11, and 14 uh, was std allocator. Uh, asterisk. It has occurred to me that uh, scoped allocator adapter was also in 11, uh, but that's just an adapter. It didn't give you an actual allocator type. You could make a scoped allocator adapter of std allocators, but that would be silly. Um, so the only allocator type in pre-17 was std allocator, which is stateless. However, uh, even all the way back in 11 and really back in 03, although it was more kind of fuzzy, the rules were a little bit more Wild West back in 03, um, the allocator model had basically been pinned down um, that a vector would have an allocator instance inside yeah. itself. Things would go through that instance. And so the question naturally arises, uh, what kind of stuff can we put inside that instance? What kind of state can we put in our allocator? Um, and this leads to people trying to do the wrong kind of stateful allocators. Uh, you might think, okay, uh, I want to make an in-place vector um, that just holds all of its uh, memory inside itself, uh, doesn't allocate anything from the heap, it just has a fixed buffer that's going to allocate out of. I'm going to make this uh, class here. Uh, this is, this is going to be my allocator type. I would have called it allocator except that I wanted to call it bad um, so that if you cut and paste this code, it would say bad and you would have to realize that before you used it because um, you shouldn't use this. But what we're trying to do here is we're trying to say the allocator has within itself a big old buffer of uh, 1K and it's aligned. Uh, by the way, this is new. This was new in 11, I think. Uh, so this is not terribly new syntax at this point, but align as, I love it. Um, and it knows how much it's used and when you allocate it, it bumps the pointer and gives you some memory. Um, and obviously this is slide code. So even though you shouldn't use this anyway, don't use it also for engineering reasons. Uh, um, and it's missing, you know, deallocate would be a, a no op and so on. Um, but I called this bad. Um, now it is stateful. And I'm not saying that stateful is necessarily bad. I mean, that's the whole point. Of, I'm not saying all your allocators need to be stateless because we're building up to PMR allocator, which is not. Um, but I'm claiming that this is a bad kind of stateful allocator. Um, but it looks very similar to the slide code on the next slide. C++17 adds polymorphic allocator, um, which as I said at the beginning is basically a pointer to a mem uh, std PMR memory resource, which is a particular uh, base class um, that you can then derive various kinds of allocators from. Uh, on this slide I show a particularly trivial kind of memory resource derived from std PMR memory resource. Um, and it looks just the same as our bad allocator from the previous slide, except now I'm not calling it an allocator. I'm not calling it bad either. I'm calling it a memory resource. I'm calling it a trivial, re trivial memory resource. Um, and we take that buffer and we put it inside the resource. And then when we want to get an allocator, we're actually going to use a different type as our allocator. We're going to use polymorphic allocator of int or whatever our value type is. Um, and I'm going to pass to it the address, a pointer to this memory resource. So now I've, I've separated the state out from the allocator. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So is, is allocate a virtual it's a member in the base class or what? Like how allocate is a uh, virtual member in the base class. So yes, memory res uh, std PMR memory resource. Well, so we can imagine over I lied. Yeah. This is slide code. Um, so <laughs> allocate is non-virtual. Okay. And so this code would be broken. Do allocate is the private virtual uh, member function that you're supposed to override. Allocate is a non-virtual function that's public that calls do allocate. Um, well, we will see the slide. We will see the actual code in about six slides. Um, so, but yes, the the basic mechanism here. This is still a good question. Is, is virtual? Okay. Basic mechanism is virtual. Um, all right. Um, so we have separated our state from our allocator. So our allocator still has stuff in it. It's not stateless. It's not like std allocator, which is empty. It has stuff in it. But I would almost argue that it's not a stateful allocator. It's a valueful allocator. Our allocator now has a value, namely the value of the address of this memory resource. Right? But it doesn't really have state. We're not going to be treating it as an object. We're not going to be mutating it. 
there's a sense in which, just like an int can have the value 42, our allocator can now have the value address of this trivial resource. And so I'm going to keep calling it a stateful allocator, but it's not really state, it's value. Um, and I have a whole slide on that. Object like bad, value like good. Right. So our bad approach to making a stateful allocator, um, our allocator was object-like. It had a buffer directly within it. We were going to actually put objects into that buffer. Uh, it, so it had mutable state because we were actually going to change the value in that buffer. Uh, the source of memory was directly in the object. Uh, allocate and deallocate then mutated the object directly, so they needed to be non-const. Um, in our stdpmr polymorphic allocator, or anything that behaves like it, uh, it is value-like. It has state, but only immutable state, in a sense. Um, that it, its state represents its value, and that's all it is. Um, Source of memory is shared among all copies of value header with the same value. This is actually going to become important in a couple of slides. Um, interestingly, allocate and deallocate can actually become const on the allocator, because the allocator, the allocator's version of allocate is just delegating to the memory resources version of allocate. Um, and so we could actually make it const. I think it is actually weird and a design mistake that is unrectifiable at this point that uh, the, ST, the original STL had uh, uh, non-const allocate and deallocate on std allocator um, and allocators in general. I really think they should have been const member functions. Um, uh, if our allocator object has state, uh, if we're putting things directly inside it, then obviously every time we move it to a different address or, or make a copy of it somewhere else, we are potentially introducing some sort of bug, some sort of really difficult to find bug too. Um, whereas if our allocator is value-like, if, if all it holds is a value, then by definition we can uh, copy them around, we can even compare them for equality, you know. Uh, we can do all of the usual Stepanov uh, regular type operations on these uh, allocators, and that's awesome. Um, and then the one thing that might be considered a bad sign on the right-hand side is that uh, when we put all the state into the allocator, there was no shared state. Now, this was a problem because then when we made a copy of the allocator, we, we copied something that wasn't supposed to be shared. Um, on the right-hand side, we do have everything pointing to the same memory resource and sharing that memory resource. And so we have to think about the lifetime of the stuff they're sharing, of who owns, so who owns the memory resource. Um, but my claim, going all the way back to the, the synopsis of the talk, uh, is that PMR, uh, polymorphic allocator and memory resource clarify our thinking about allocators in general. Um, it is a, a very simple special case of what I claim is a general rule um, that an allocator value, the allocator is a value type, it represents a handle to a source of memory and some other orthogonal bits that I will talk about. Um, but this explains how we can have heaps that are used by multiple containers, um, all of which have handles to that particular heap. Uh, we can also have allocators that just sit outside of the heap, uh, not even associated with any container, um, and are maybe used by a standard algorithm or uh, by a promise or future or something like that that needs an allocator. Um, and we can have separate heaps in our programs, and the number of heaps and the number of allocators is not necessarily correlated at all. Um, Okay, so I've said an allocator value represents a handle to a source of memory, and you're now thinking, what about stateless allocators? What about std allocator? It doesn't have any bits in it at all. It's empty. How can it possibly represent a handle to a memory resource? There's no memory resource associated with a std allocator. It just uses new and delete. Um, well, a stateless allocator represents a handle to a source of memory, plus some orthogonal pieces, where the source of memory is a global singleton. So a std allocator it represents a handle to the global new delete heap, um, which is a global singleton, if you're lucky. If you're using DLLs, I guess it gets more complicated. Um, but essentially, we want to think of the source memory as, as a global singleton. And so how many bits do we need to represent uh, one possibility? We need log of one, which is zero bits. And so we look at how many bits a std allocator has. It has zero bits. Cool. Math checks out. Just to drive this home, um, it's now been six slides, so I'm going to so show some actual code. And by actual, I mean not actual, but 
It takes up more of a slide. Um, so this is what STIDPMR uh, memory resource looks like in C++17 in the standard library. We have the public interface, uh, allocate, deallocate, and a function called is equal. Um, and uh, by the way, remember how I said objects can have a method that is named compare or is named is equal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's comparing values. This is a perfect example of that. And I'm kind of glad that it was not named operator equal equal. Oh, wait, it was. Um, but at least there's also a, a name for it. Um, and there's a virtual destructor. Um, and each of these public functions, uh, which again are not virtual, so they can't be overridden, those are just the entry points to get into whatever the uh, particular memory resource child class is going to do when it does allocate or do delete or do is equal. Those are pure virtual private members, uh, which are they're pure virtual, so they're not implemented by default, but each child class will implement them in its own particular way and can have its own data members and whatnot. And again, this is memory resource, so this is an object-like class. This is something you're going to instantiate, and you're going to have one instance of it somewhere specific in memory, and it's going to know about uh, you know, a specific heap that objects are going to live on. It's not going to move around, it's going to sit in place, and you're going you're to mutate its state. That's why its allocate and deallocate methods are non-const, because they are mutating. They're actually changing the state of the heap by allocating and deallocating things from it. Um, so a concrete example of a memory resource uh, would look something like this. Um, we've got uh, a function, a uh, new delete resource, um, which is just a uh, function that would appear in the header or something. It's got a sat static singleton, uh, and it returns the address of that. Um, the static singleton inherits from memory resource and has overrides for the three virtual uh, functions in the implementation. It doesn't care about the public interface. Public interface was taken care of by the base class. It only cares about the private stuff, which means when I implement this, I don't even need to say public or private or anything at the top. I, I can just go straight into the implementation, which is kind of cool. I kind of like that. Um, uh, so we have do allocate, and it just calls operator new. And we have do deallocate, it just calls operator delete. And we have do is equal that just says, am I literally the same object? Do I have the same address? Then yes, then I'm equal. Um, so that's new delete resource, um, and that is also in C++17. Uh, that's an example of, of a kind of thing you can get from the standard library. And this is polymorphic allocator, STIDPMR polymorphic allocator, as it appears in the C++17 standard library, uh, with some bits trimmed out, I think, for the slide. Um, oh. <laughs> in the previous slide. In the previous slide. The data type is called singleton new delete resource. Is there anything singleton specific in that data type? Um, Yes-ish. So, so, so number one, a singleton new delete resource is my private name. I should have said underscore, underscore or something, and then people will yell at me if that's reserved for the implementation. Um, but yeah, the, the singleton new delete resource is a exposition only type that I made up. The only thing that's actually mandated in the standard is this function, the new delete resource function, that's going to return a pointer to an unspecified uh, child class. And so you're basically asking, do I, need do I need this to be a static singleton, or could I just return the address of like a new object every time? No, no, I mean, in the name of the data type, what shall we lose if we omit singleton? Oh. We just name it new delete resource. Well, you can't name it new delete resource because that name is taken by the, the public API. Um, <laughs> But you could name it no, new delete I memory mean, resource some, or whatever. Something not containing the yeah. word singleton in it. You it could certainly simple. remove the name singleton from it. But, okay. I think the point that's being made is whether something is or isn't a singleton is tied to its type. So for example, you could have two pricing services that are both singletons, one's for stocks and one's for you know, right. something else, you know, like derivatives, right? And, and, and they're both singletons, but they use the same data structure. And so the data structure is named pricing engine. And then you have the singleton, you know, equities pricing engine, you have a right. digit price. You, know, you see what I'm saying? Yes, so I do see what you're saying. What he's saying is why build into the type its purpose? Why build into the type its purpose? There's nothing about it that necessarily means it has to be a singleton. I could make two of these if I wanted to, right? Yeah, he's saying um, that, that would come up. Because when you need one of them, 
You might need to. When you need one of them, you might need to. However, in this specific, and that is true in general. I absolutely agree with the, the pricing engine example, which I'm sure the camera didn't pick up. Um, but yes, like there are definitely cases where something might be a singleton, but only sort of by accident, and later you might need a second one. However, in this specific case, um, it is specifically designed for interacting with operator new and operator delete, which again form a global heap singleton. You're never going to have two operator news in the same program that do different things. And we have this is equal function, which is specifically concerned about object identity. If I had two of these things, two singleton new delete resources instances in the program, then they would not compare equal, but they would have the same effect. And that is unfortunate. It's not like, like everything's going to blow up, but it's unfortunate. It's better to, in this case, if you have two of these, you probably have a bug. So it's not like you couldn't have two of these, but this is very strongly intended to be just one per program. So maybe hopefully to drive home the point or perhaps beat something that's already dead. Uh, you named a singleton just to illustrate to us that the global heap is a singleton, whether or not we want it to be. The global heap is a singleton, whether or not we want it to be. And that was the sole reason that I named it singleton. Let's go with that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the do is equal function, should it return true? No, because notice it does not take a singleton new delete resource ampersand. It takes a reference to any memory resource in the entire program, and it's virtual. Um, so uh, now you might ask, I almost expect someone to ask, shouldn't it like dynamic cast or is it weird like that? And it used to, in one of the published, it may be in the published standard it said that, it was a DR. It definitely shouldn't say that. Com equal equal should never do a dynamic cast. That's crazy. Um, and so now it doesn't. Um, but yeah, it also can't just return true because it can point, it's any object in the verb, yeah. So if you would have guarded, a, so if it was allowed to have multiple objects of this one, the do is equal would have a return type ID if matches? Uh, because all singleton new delete resources are considered equal, so if you had multiple one of yours, it should guard against that, but because you only have one. Could you implement operator e or do is equal as if like type ID equal equal singleton new delete resource, then say true, otherwise say false? Uh, yeah, probably. Probably, but let's not. Let's not do that. Yeah, one more. Now I should go on. Sorry if this is, you know, slightly non-do underscore methods uh, and mark the class final. Uh, is that kind of the intended customization point for things that aren't expecting to be polymorphic memory resources? Should we, maybe? You're saying, should we ever overload the public API of memory resource in our child class? Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't but do that. Forced to use the virtual model. Yeah. The I mean, you can, it's just that then it will do a different thing depending on whether I've got memory resource star or new delete singleton star. You can't override them. You can't override them. You can't override them. You can overload them in the, you can overload them in the, you can hide them. Oh, well, okay, yes. You can hide them. By something that looks an awful lot like overloading, but yes, you're, you're hiding it. Um, so technically you can do that, but you still shouldn't. I assume you agree you should, you should never do that. That's a crazy idea. All right, good. Um, okay, so this was an example of implementing uh, new delete resource, which again is standard. Um, then uh, we can take our memory resource. So here's our memory resource, and then we, uh, we did the new delete resource. And then the thing that points to it, the actual allocator type, remember a memory resource is not an allocator. Um, it's not a value type at all. This is our value type, uh, polymorphic allocator. Um, it's even got a type def telling you it's a value type. Um, no, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> and it contains a pointer to a memory resource. Um, and notice that it has functions allocate and deallocate, uh, which are non-virtual, uh, and they could be const, but they aren't, um, because all they do is take the memory resource that we're pointing to and delegate to its allocate and deallocate functions. Um, is there any reason 
Why does it take a pointer and not a reference? Um, I don't know exactly, but uh, I think taking a pointer is nicer because it's got pointer semantics. Like, but I can pass null. You can pass null, and that might be bad. Um, but if normally when I take something and I, I pass in x, I'm ex sort of expecting it to work with the value of x, or, or in some, you know, I'm not expecting to worry about lifetimes. I think that taking a pointer makes it clearer that, okay, yeah, it's going to have a pointer to this thing. I better make sure I understand what the lifetime is. Uh, I don't know the history. John might. The ancient rule that when you're going to retain the address of something beyond the call of the function, if you pass it by reference, you need help. <laughs> if you're going to retain a pointer to the thing beyond the lifetime <laughs> of the function and you pass it by reference, you need help. Um, yes, I would agree with that. Is that like a is that particular Bloomberg so coding guideline or? Uh, there is a rule, I forgot what it was, but it was, there was, first there was uh, um, Myers, then there was Murray, and there was Cargill, and that's Murray's, in Murray's book, from like 1991. It's a rule. It's an offline it, it's, a, it's a book by Murray from 1991. It's in there. It's around them. It's around them. Old, it's a very good rule. Yeah. It's a definitely a very good rule. Like, where does it come from? It comes from my head, and I hope all of your heads. And Rob but Murray, Murray's head put it in writing first. And Rob Murray's head put it in writing first. And it was an old rule then. All right, excellent. Um, cool. Um, so OK, so polymorphic allocator. Um, and there is uh, some stuff on here that we're going to talk more about later, like where this template class U thing comes from. Um, but what else did I want to talk about on the slide? Oh, yes. The whole point of this was uh, allocators with state. This allocator. Uh, has state or has a value consisting of, let's say, 64 bits on your typical desktop system. Um, and so it has 64 bits of state. And by changing those bits, you can make it point to pretty much anywhere in memory that might have a memory resource object. And so it can point to any of 2 to the 64th different memory resources um, in those 64 bits. That's just plain old math. Um, are you likely to have 2 to the 64th different memory resources in your program? No. but. This thing can point to it. Wherever it is, it can point to it. Um, but 64 bits is pretty big. We could imagine a one byte allocator um, where its state is just eight bits. Right? And we do all sorts of crazy atomic stuff to make sure that we're managing this correctly. But essentially, we just have a big global table, S table at the top there uh, with 256 entries. And we're going to store inside the allocator, we're just going to store an index into that table. Um, and uh, I actually put enough stuff behind this that I could test it in Wandbox and like it seemed to work, but don't trust my lock-free programming <laughs> or yours or anyone's. <laughs> um, but so this is an allocator. It's, it's a perfectly cromulent allocator type um, and it only has eight bits and it can point to any one of, of 256 different allocators in the entire program um, because that's two to the eighth. Um, that's just math. That's cool. Here I have a zero byte allocator. It has zero bits of state inside itself. Uh, and it looks very similar to the last slide, except that it's MR function instead of doing a table lookup is just hard coded to always return new delete resource. Um, and this can point to any of two to the zeroth is one different memory resource. Um, and this is std allocator. It's more heavyweight. Um, and a lot more resistant to the, the inliner. Um, but this is essentially, I mean, this, functionally, this is equivalent to std allocator. It does new and delete for everything. And it doesn't need any bits of state in order to figure that out. Um, all right, so in all of these cases, um, I went from a 64-bit allocator to an 8-bit allocator to a 0-bit allocator. Um, and uh, those were all allocators that could point to memory resources, specifically the, the std PMR memory resource base class. Um, so in a sense, you could put the same value, the same pointer value, into any one of these different types. And that plays with its representation in memory and its size of how it's represented as an object. It doesn't really play with the value at all. So maybe we even want to be able to cast between all of these different allocator types, and maybe that would be reasonable. Um, but also maybe not. Corollaries to this new value forward way of thinking, um, allocator types should be copyable, just like pointers, because right? that's 
if an allocator is just a handle to a heap plus some other bits that we're going to talk about later, um, then it should be copyable because you, you can take that value and make a copy of it. That's what it means to be a value. Um, and this was always true and always necessary to be able to make copies of allocators, but now it's very obvious, I think. Um, allocator types uh, should be cheaply copyable. So not just copyable, but cheaply copyable, just like pointers. They don't need to be trivially copyable. And we saw an example in the one byte allocator where the copy constructor actually had to do some work to maintain some reference counts um, because it was worrying about the lifetime of the point and two memory resource. Um, they don't need to be trivially copyable. Um, and memory resource types, the actual object type that is the heap, uh, should generally be immobile, should generally live in one place so you can get its address. Um, if it's moving around, then you're going to need a more complicated name to identify it, a more complicated handle to identify it than just a, a machine pointer. Um, right, so object-like memory resource types, uh, value-like allocator types. It seems like the last bullet is saying it generally should be this way, but it could be this other way. Is that correct? Uh, it generally should be this way, and this is one reason that it, that it maybe should need to be. If, if the memory resource does allocate chunks out of itself, then it damn well better stay in the same place. Um, oh, if the memory resource holds a buffer somewhere else outside of itself, then maybe it's okay if it moves around, but really, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I misread it. I, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about an object where the, the memory resource was part of the object. In other words, the, the actual resource was part of the object's footprint. Oh. Which could happen, but it's that's weird. right. I, I would say that's very close to my struct bad from yeah. from way back. Yes, I'm. Th this is the memory resource allocates chunks out of itself. The allocator should never allocate chunks out of itself because the allocator should be a value. Yes, yeah, so this, this is a little bit confusing. A because I left out any connective conjunction on that last bullet point, and also because the first two bullets are about allocator types, and the third bullet is about the memory resource type, which mm -hmm. is the object type. Mm -hmm. Right. With this in mind, why is it that the is equal function is uh, defined in terms of the address of the allocator and not the identity of the memory resource it's pointing. Why is do is equal defined in terms of the, why is that a member function of the memory resource and not of the polymorphic allocator? Um, and that is essentially because polymorphic allocators operator equal equal, which is good and should exist and compares values, defers to the equal equal of memory resource, which defers to the virtual uh, do is equal. Um, and that might is allowed to return true in cases where it's not literally the same object, but maybe it wants to return true for some other reason. Like it's saying, OK, I'm, I'm not literally that guy, but I can, de I can deallocate his memory if you need me to. Like maybe it, it would return true in that case. Um, I don't think there are any standard uh, allocators in 17 that do anything other than just compare pointers. I think um, there are two standard allocators as of right now other than the... Yeah, the synchronized point. pool and uh, unsynchronized pool and, and monotonic buffer resource, and I think they all do just pointer equality. Um, all right. Uh, Corollary is the new way of thinking. Um, so basically allocators being handle types, being... Uh, values that identify objects, um, basically they should behave like other handle types, like pointers or iterators. Um, and they have to do as the pointers do in one more subtle way. So you might have noticed, probably not, there was too, too much noise on this slide, lock-free programming. Um, but right in the middle of all that lock-free stuff, there's a copy constructor for this thing that does stuff with reference counts, and I did not write a move constructor. So this is a copyable type, but if you try to move it, it will just use the copy constructor. It will not try to do the efficient thing by stealing the guts from the other thing, and then it wouldn't have to mess around with the uh, incrementing references. Um, so it is copyable, but not efficiently movable. This is because allocator types have to be copy-only types. This was a, an LWG issue, and it was resolved, and now the standard looks like this. Uh, I don't like it, but this is how it is. Uh, just like pointers, if I std move assign a pointer, that makes a copy. If I std move assign an allocator, that needs to make a copy. And the reason it needs to make a copy is because we might have code like on the bottom of this slide where 
I put some stuff in V1, and it's got an allocator that has an, a certain value or a certain state, and then I'm going to std move assign or move copy, or move construct uh, V1 into V2, and now V1 is in a moved from state. Uh, so it is you know, unspecified but valid state. Um, and then I can do things that involve no precondition, like clear it, and now I know it's empty. And then I can start pushing things back into it again, and this should all work great. Um, but if its allocator has been moved from and is now in an unspecified but valid state for the allocator, pointing to I don't know what memory resource, and I start trying to push things back into it, it's not going to work. And so rather than saying, OK, when we move construct the thing, we just won't move construct the allocator. We'll do a copy of the allocator. They decided to say, we will move construct the allocator, but it secretly needs to do a copy, which seems like putting the cart before the horse to me. But the post condition on moving of an allocator, this is from the, the standards uh, allocator type requirements. Yeah. Would you say that's good code? Would I say this is, you said good code, right? Yeah. OK. Not would I say this was screwed code. Um, <laughs> Would I encourage people to do these three lines at the bottom? Yeah. Um, no, uh, but I'm not sure that you can figure out what exactly is bad about it to ensure that it never comes up, even in a standard algorithm. Right? I mean, if I'm, if I'm removing something from a vector and then I have to move out of this guy and then move all these guys down, is that sort of doing this or is that not quite doing this? And if not, why not? Like, this is going to happen. And so it has to be made to work somehow. One way to make it work is to say, OK, vector never moves out of its allocator. The other way to say it is vector does move out of its allocator, but that is a no-op. And that's what they decided to do. Is v1 clear really allowed? Is yeah. that specified yeah. by vector? It has no preconditions. Um, that, no, it's the, the precondition for clear has a valid v1 is in a valid but unspecified state, and, and whatever state that is, whether it's got stuff in it or doesn't have stuff in it, I can call clear on it. And that, I mean, that kind of needs to be true. If that weren't true, that would be a pitfall. I, mean, I am glad that that is not true. I, I think we, we should have specified that a move from object is assignable and destructible and nothing else. Yeah. Honestly, I wish they had, uh, well, yeah. No, because you have to specify a new allocator. It's not the same. Mm, I'm going to move on. You may, in fact, be right about it. Well, no, because of allocator stickiness, which I'm not really going to cover here. I've got like one slide on it, but yeah. Is it, it, might it be more appropriate to describe it as, like, it's not really copy only. It's just that the semantics of moving it is the same as a copy operation. So That's right. Like how pointers, like, you can move a pointer, but it's just the same semantics as copying the value of pointer. Yes. How uh, move is non-destructive? Move is non-destructive. Well, C++ never has destructive move. Um, yeah, I mean, I like my copy-only term. I, don't, I mean, you're, you're saying someone could interpret that as meaning that the move constructor was deleted. Yes, um, um, it's but non-mutating move. Non -mutating well, move. Is what a copy is. Yeah, it, it is a type with a non-mutating move. I'm going to keep saying copy only because I don't think that's really, I don't think that's confusing um, terribly. I mean, it, it's definitely ambiguous when you get into the details, but I, I think if I say this type is copy only, it's sort of like when you do a move that's equivalent to a copy. It wouldn't mean like, oh, you're trying to move it. I'm going to stop you from doing that. Like, why would it stop it? Just make a copy. Um, so, uh, so this means that you can't move allocators any more cheaply than you copy them because they have to copy even when they move. And so uh, how worried do we actually have to be about the cost of copying an allocator? Um, is this something that, that's going to add up if I'm copying all these allocators all the time and I can never save by, by moving? Uh, so I wrote a little test. Uh, just, just, this is just, I wanted to put some numbers in this presentation. Um, so these are uh, allocators, copies, and moves that happen on the allocator uh, object uh, when you do a uh, a list copy assignment, or a, sorry, a list uh, copy construct or uh, move construct or the same things with vector. Uh, before and after the m dash turn out to be the same, but it's just before the m dash is uh, for stateless allocators like std allocator. After is if they have state because the rules are slightly different, if, if they're sticky, if they uh, don't propagate on copy. Um, and it turns out the same number of copies seem to be made in both cases according to my test. Uh, 
Now, my test uh, did run into a pitfall at first because I was inheriting from std allocator, and so I was inheriting all of its uh, nested type defs, and uh, uh, I think I caught that. Uh, this pitfall will be explored more in slide 32 of my talk tomorrow. Um, so why do we see all of these extra copies moved? I mean, we should see one, right? We should see one in every case. Why do we see multiple um, copies and moves going on here? Uh, and the answer is rebinding. What is rebinding? Allocators are what I'm going to call rebindable family types. And I'm sure we can, we can also bike shed this name. Um, but I'm going to call it rebindable family and because um, you might have noticed that on std allocator and all allocator types, the, uh, al the type to allocate, the value type, uh, is baked into the allocator type itself. So I have an alloc of int, an alloc of long, an alloc of double, an alloc of void star star star. And these are all different types, different C++ types. Um, but they all belong to the same general family. If I know how to allocate integers, then I also essentially should know how to allocate longs. Um, I just need to somehow take this allocator I've got and manipulate it to produce longs instead of ints, or space for longs instead of space for ints. Um, and, uh, right. So typed allocator is baked into the allocator type. Uh, allocate of int dot allocate to means allocate to ints specifically. I don't have to say uh, what type I'm allocating because it's already baked into the type of the allocator. Uh, and this works great uh, because I can allocate n ints and that will allocate space for n contiguous ints and that works great if that's what you want and that's what you want if and only if you're implementing std vector. Um, std list does not want a bunch of ints in a row. Std list wants a single node, uh, right? And it's gonna have a T but it's also going to have a you know, forward pointer and a back pointer and, and some other stuff. Uh, and uh, std map uh, actually requires uh, that the allocator type's value type be the value type of the map, which is std pair of const k comma v. And if you get that type wrong, you have undefined behavior. That's not very cool. Um, and it doesn't even want to allocate that type. It's like, I wanted to find a, a gif or something of, uh, is, there, is it Veruca Salt or Violet Beauregard? It's Veruca Salt. I was like, give, give me, give me, give me. Give me that type, I need that type specifically. Oh yeah, I don't care about that type, I want a different type. Um, um, so every allocator type is really a whole family of related types. Uh, an allocator value, which is representable in one of the family's types, must be representable in all of its types. So if I have a handle to a heap expressed as type alloc of int, I should be able to convert that value from type allocator of int to type alloc of long. Um, whenever I am preserving the value, doing a value preserving type conversion. So I know the value will be representable in the new type um, and there's no weird danger about lifetimes or anything happening here. Um, how do I express a conversion in C++? I express it with a static cast, right? an implicit conversion or explicit conversion. Um, and so I should be able to static cast between different allocator types. And we saw that earlier with the template of class U. Um, in the uh, polymorphic allocator slide. Um, so rebinding. Rebinding is useful when your generic al algorithm requires a foo of t um, where uh, you, the library, are providing the t or, or multiple t's, uh, but your user is providing the foo. The foo is the strategy. The foo is the handle to the heap. Um, and t is something that you're making up that the user may not have access to, like a list node type. Um, there are at least two ways to do this. Uh, way number one preferred by the STL is rebinding, uh, which works through a traits class. We have this allocator traits in the standard library. Uh, you get the allocator traits of your current allocator and you ask it to rebind the allocator to you and it gives you back a new type, which is alloc of you. Um, the other way that it would be natural to approach this problem is template template parameters, um, which look like this. They've been in since C++03. Compiler support back then probably was what kept them from really being used in the STL would be my guess. Um, and this looks like it might be simpler, but it's maybe a little bit less flexible. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, when I say template template parameters are unused in the STL, there, there might be a question, uh, are, aren't they used by the container adapters? Stack and queue doesn't stack default to vector and so on, no, but, the, but stack defaults to vector of t specifically, and so it doesn't actually take a template template parameter, it just takes a class parameter. Question? In the 
in the first of these two classes and the second one, what is U? Uh, U is uh, like a list node type or some, some internal type that I am provided. It's one of my T's in the text at the top. It says, you provide the T's. So that, that's this U, is one of those T's that I'm providing. The user has given me an allocator for some T that I don't really want, and I'm going to rebind it so it can allocate U, whatever that is. I should have picked a letter that wasn't also an English word. Yeah. Uh, I think the reason is actually that you need a meta closure for the, for the allocator type. You do need to rebind alloc because the allocator type has more than one template parameter. And so you couldn't pass it as a template template parameter because the signature of the template wouldn't match. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> observation about why template template parameter wouldn't work out of the box. Uh, Answer, it could, you just need to wrap your thing in a helper class. It, it, yes, exactly. But uh, or a helper type def, which I hope is what we're getting toward. I hope we're going to get that I can pass an alias uh, type def into this thing and it'll just work. Um, uh, and I think on some compilers these days you can, and I think the support is somewhat spotty as to what, where you can put dot, 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 and it will magically be ignored or accepted or, I'm not sure. Um, uh, so allocators are rebindable family types. Um, and uh, the STL does not use this way. Um, there's one more way that didn't fit on the slide, by the way, which is that you could pass in the, basically pass in the traits type itself. Um, instead of passing in A of T, and then I call allocator traits of A of T, I could pass in alloc traits directly, and then I could say alloc traits colon colon rebind alloc. Um, and also, I don't think there's anywhere in the STL that uses that, although regex traits and char traits get close. But they don't actually parameterize any types this way. Um, so if this is so useful, where else do we see it used? Um, well, we have this thing called allocator traits uh, that allows us to rebind allocators, rebindable families. We have a similar thing for fancy pointers. We have pointer traits that allows us to rebind pointers. Uh, so I can take a pointer of T, call pointer traits, rebind U, and get pointer of U. Um, cool. Um, for smart pointer types, um, there is a thing called a static pointer cast, or reinterpret pointer cast, or dynamic pointer cast, that allows me to take a static pointer to t, a uh, value, and turn it into a static pointer to u. Anytime I could do that conversion on t star to u star, I can also do it on, on shared pointer to t, uh, to shared pointer of u, or unique pointer. Um, and so if I want to rebind shared pointer of t and get a shared pointer of u, I might consider using this decal type expression. And then I would decide, no, no, I won't do that. This is horribly inconvenient. Why did they not just have a smart pointer traits uh, or a rebind operation directly in the shared pointer type? Wouldn't that make it easier? Yeah. Um, and promise and future types, right? Uh, this is getting a little even further afield, um, where if we have a future type that takes a dot then, um, then I have this concept of uh, chaining continuations together and transforming a T into a U, and that's going to transform my future of T into a future of U. Um, but if I want to actually name that type future of U by rebinding future of T, I know the type future of T, and I know the type U, and I want to get future of U. How do I do that? Uh, I can use this crazy decal type expression, um, or I could not do that. Wouldn't it be nice to have future traits? Wait, can you? We don't have lambdas in unevaluated context yet. This has a lambda in an unevaluated context. That is true. We also don't have dot then, though, which is a bigger deal. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, this totally would not work. We have libraries that have dot that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and the fact that we have multiple libraries with dot then is exactly why it would be nice to have future traits that could rebind the uh, future for any given library's future. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, notably, we do not, we have iterator traits, but iterator traits does not have a rebind uh, template. We are not allowed to take an iterator of, you know, vector of int colon colon iterator and say, that's nice, I want the same value, but I want it to iterate over longs. No, you're not allowed to do that because it doesn't make any sense, right? So it makes sense that we don't have that. I contend that it doesn't make sense that we don't have it also for these things where I think it does make sense. <coughs> Something like that. Each rebindable family has a prototype. Uh, or a representative of the equivalence class. Um, and uh, C++ is kind of lucky in that we have irregular void. Um, so void is kind of a magic type that we can use uh, as the, the, repre the, the logical place for us all to meet if we want a, a proto prototype. Um, 
we have, uh, you know, void pointer is, is considered uh, magic in some sense to allocators, that they have a pointer type def and a void pointer type def, because there's something special about void. Um, and so pointer and smart pointer families have a void pointer type, um, sort of a prototype for that family of, of fancy pointers or uh, smart pointers. Uh, allocator families have a proto allocator type, alloc of void, um, with an asterisk that no, they don't really, but I'm trying to get this idea out there that they should. Um, and this, act, this concept is actually coming. I, I don't see any way that it's going to get derailed, given that it's in the networking TS and the executor's TS uh, proposal, um, that there's going to be a way to get the, the proto-allocator, which is just something that it may not itself be an allocator. Note it's not an allocator. It can't have an allocate function, because that would have to return you know, space for n void objects, which doesn't exist. Um, so it doesn't have allocate or deallocate. But what it does have is you can take this value the, a value of that type, and you can rebind it to get an allocator of int or an allocator of list node or whatever you need. Um, and so this is useful because if we were designing the STL today, yeah. Like, you sure I, it's not this one? Future void. Uh, I'm, I'm not convinced about that. I would see future void STD any as a prototype. No, Ooh, no. I don't return a value. All I do is like join on completion. Yeah, but from this definition of prototype, I see that it's mostly like a generalization of pretty much anything on the family. It's a, it's a generalization in a very specific type system way. That the question was, why is the prototype for future, future of void instead of future of any, uh, like future of std any? And the answer is std any is this crazy heavyweight library yeah, type. Sure. Um, but, but conceptually, it's also because std any is this crazy heavyweight library type. It doesn't make sense to have your prototype be this crazy heavyweight library thing when it could be this very simple built-in, already kind of magic void. Right? And again, we're not, gonna, we're not actually going to create objects of, of the, well, in this case, we might create an object of this type. Um, but it's essentially just carrying around this. And you know what? Future is actually significantly different from pointer or allocator. Um, because future is not carrying around a value, whereas the other two very clearly are. We can have a value of void pointer type, and we can rebind it to get it, which means static cast it to get an int star or whatever we need. Um, if I have a future void, I can't use that to carry um, a future of int through, which is, I guess, essentially where you were going with that. Um, yes. So in that sense, yes, you were anticipating that future is kind of different from these others in that sense. Whereas I was just going to gloss over that because that was completely irrelevant to where I, to any of the rest of the slides that I did, and so I was just throwing that out there. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, so if we were designing the STL today, uh, we might use the proto allocator type in our interfaces. Um, so rather than this uh, Veruca Salt style, uh, you know, I need a map, so I need to name my allocator of alloc of pair of constant and, and 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 get that type exactly right, or else I have undefined behavior. I could just uh, do alloc avoid and just pass that everywhere. And the container, whatever the container needs, it's going to have to rebind the thing anyway. Just let it do that rebinding. And then we'll allocate using the, the rebound thing. Um, by the way, if you hadn't figured this out yet, or if I hadn't said it, I forget if I said it. Um, but uh, the rebinding that's going to happen in the list and map cases is yet another reason why struct bad way back at the beginning was awful. Right? Because it had a big buffer inside itself. And then what's the first thing we're going to do? Make a copy with the right type and throw out our original buffer. Um, back there first. How does this actually stay, stay on the same page from if we're doing that bind to create the original type there? How does this save on instantiations? Uh, it is a small savings, and it's certainly not going to save your five minute compile. But on that last example of std map, um, I'm making up this alloc of pair of constant comma int. That is a type that does not need to exist anywhere in the program. Right? I'm never going to allocate an object of that type. Um, and so having to make that type is kind of silly. Whereas alloc of void, I'm going to make that every single time I use the allocator. I'm going to make that at least once. So. Are all allocators required to be rebindable to any type? Are all allocators re required to be rebindable to any type? Um, essentially, yes. I would say yes. Uh, I, if you have a different opinion, I would not argue about it. Um, I th in my opinion, it's in that gray area of uh, kind of like, is the predicate function to, to uh, std 
copy if allowed to modify the operand. It's like, n no, but if you do it and you don't get caught, maybe it's OK. You know, if you had an allocator that could only allocate things of certain alignment, and then it like rejected things of greater alignment, like, and you didn't use that feature and you didn't get caught, OK, like, sure. Um, but I would say it should. John? I want to make a very bold statement, which is I have never in my entire life seen any need for rebind ever. And what can I say? I, I just think it's a figment of somebody's imagination it should never have existed. Rebind should never have existed. Um, I think that the polymorphic allocator way of doing it, where it just deals in like void star and byte counts, uh, makes a great deal of sense. Mm -hmm. Rebind is needed because mm -hmm. we bake int into the type of alloc events. If, if we didn't do that, terms, then probably, yeah. yeah. Probably, yeah. Uh, uh, with not requiring uh, the rebinding, like in the hypothetical better STL case, would, not, would that not incur a performance penalty? Because it's basically doing an indirect uh, cast at every allocation. Uh, would that incur a performance penalty from doing all of those rebind copies? Um, yes. Now, that there's a question of, do you do the rebind copy before every single allocation on an as-needed basis, or do you do the rebind once in the constructor and save the rebound allocator? Um, and uh, I think implementations, uh, I want to say they they vary, but I also want to say they don't vary because I think the, the standard right now requires that there's like a get allocator function that needs to give back the right type, and it needs to give it back by reference, and so the vector or whatever needs to store the allocator in the appropriate type for, for the get allocator function. Yeah. And I also think they can't store a rebound allocator because they have to call construct anyway on the not rebound type when they actually construct the user data, so they have to rebind it then back anyway, so it wouldn't actually matter comment about calling construct and destroy. Construct and destroy actually need to be able to be called without rebinding. Oh, really? They need to be templates that work for any U at all, regardless of T. Um, yeah. For any reason? Yep. And there's no reason why not, really. So. Yeah. Um, back there. Yes. The map example is, it isn't that we only care about, not that we care about void the prototype, obviously, and it is clearly not the case that we care about pair, comp, whatever, because that's never going to be allocated. We care about one specific about thing, one specific thing. Which is unfortunately not nameable by me as the user. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, for, further pragmatic skepticism, very, very realistic skepticism about do we need to be able to allocate absolutely anything. Um, and no, we need to be able to allocate one very specific thing that unfortunately in many cases we can't name. And, and the yeah. The fact that you can't, like, there is a thing that you need to do. And sometimes, sometimes several things, right? Deck needs to be able to allocate two different things. Um, so, a, a, a small constant number of things, but sometimes you can't say that. If you can allocate absolutely everything, then your code will be conforming and it'll work. Uh, and, and if you take shortcuts and you don't get caught, Good on you. Um, all right, I, th I think I'm going to go on. Um, so if we designed the STL today, we would just pass proto allocators around all the, all, the all the different places. They would be rebounded point of views to allocate any particular type. Um, and you might notice that this seems pretty isomorphic to the situation that we already have with the PMR in 17, where uh, instead of using this big, complicated, you know, store the proto allocator and cast it to the alloc of t and call it the appropriate allocator. If instead of doing that, uh, we just store the pointer of the memory resource, uh, and then we call allocate, and we, and we don't even, we involve t there in, in the size of t. Um, why don't we just do that? Uh, and one answer is history. Um, but another answer, another answer is that this polymorphic allocator thing is fairly big. It's the size of a pointer, and maybe we don't want that. Um, another answer is that an allocator is more than a pointer to a memory resource. So title of the talk is an allocator is a handle to a heap. But every time I say that, someone says, no, it's more than that. So I'm going to say, yes, and it's more than that. Um, 
An allocator is more than the source of memory. Um, so when we write this code, um, and we are rebinding m alloc uh, into the alloc t, and then we're calling allocate on it, and we're getting back a pointer, and we're assigning it to a variable of type auto, which will be deduced. PTR here will be of type allocator traits of alloc t colon colon pointer, which is a type def, which is usually t star. It will certainly be t star for polymorphic allocator and, and for std allocator. Um, but the standard leaves the door open for it to be something fancier, such as offset putter of t, or, or uh, if you are going to Bob Stiegel's talk on fancy pointers, uh, opposite my talk tomorrow, which you shouldn't do because you should come to my talk. <laughs> um, he's going to talk about um, uh, his particular brand of, of synthetic pointers. Oh, he's in the audience, and he's going to. I just want to say, some of you should come. Some, some of you should come. <laughs> All right, everyone on this side, go to his talk. All right, um, yes. Um, uh, so an allocator is more than the source of memory, uh, and the pointer here will be of type uh, pointer, which, which can be a synthetic pointer. Um, it is completely up to the allocator to decide how its pointers are represented. Um, so when the container uses a pointer that comes from the allocator, uh, because that is the allocator's pointer, it will be represented in the allocator's chosen way as a T star or an offset putter or a synthetic putter or whatever. Um, unfortunately, its pointers, deciding which pointers belong to the allocator, is kind of vague and wishy-washy. Um, this is the, you made this? Yeah. I made this. Um, so the, we, can, we said the container uses the pointer for all allocations. So here we have a std list, more or less. Um, and it's got the list object, and inside the list object, it has a head pointer and a tail pointer. Um, and it's also got the size, so it doesn't have to walk the list when you ask it for the size. Um, and then off on the heap, uh, controlled by the allocator, uh, we have these nodes that we've allocated, and they have pointers pointing them internally. And, and so all of these mnext and mpreev, these are going to be the pointer type, the fancy pointer type controlled by the allocator, which again is generally just a native pointer, but it could be something fancier like offset pointer. Um, now, there are two interesting things to notice about these pointers. The first interesting thing is that these two pointers on the left uh, are stored outside the heap, but they are still allocated pointers, and they must be stored using the fancy pointer type. Whereas these two green pointers on the heap are stored on the heap, but they point to objects living outside the heap. Namely, they point to m internal. Um, m next has an arrow coming out of it, but you can't see it because it's invisible. Um, but yes, they, they both point to this m internal uh, node, uh, which is stored somewhere in memory that's not necessarily on the heap. It's not necessarily in the shared memory segment if you're using offset putter. Um, it's not necessarily in the small data area. It, it's just somewhere. Um, so we must be able to convert fancy pointer m next into native reference uh, star m next, and then into native pointer this. Uh, that was the uh, first case. Is that right? Um, yeah. So that that's the case where um, we have something addressed out here on the heap. Like let's say we have this node, and we're going to call a member function on this node. Uh, we have a fancy pointer to it, but when we call the member function on it it's going to get a this pointer. And the this pointer needs to be a native pointer that refers to this object. So we need a way to take our fancy pointer and convert it into a native pointer. For any fancy pointer, it has to be convertible to a native pointer so that we can have a this pointer, for example. Um, and so if you're planning to have a fancy pointer that points off into far memory or, or some sort of addressable storage, um, that's probably not going to work. Um, and also, we have to be able to take any old native pointer, such as the address of this m internal. Uh, this, is, this we have a raw pointer to, and we need to be able to turn it into a fancy pointer so that this thing, which is a fancy pointer, can point to it. Uh, so fancy pointers and native pointers have to be interconvertible. They have to have the same range of values. Any value represented in one needs to be able to be represented in the other, and vice versa. Um, all right, so they need to be interconvertible and they both have the same exact range of values, does that mean they're the same type? Um, well, I've thought of essentially two answers to this question. Um, and this was covered in a paper that I presented in Albuquerque. 
Um, and so this is a little bit of a recap of that. Um, uh, I thought essentially two answers to these questions. Uh, uh, both answers are no. Um, they are not necessarily the same type. Uh, and there are two reasons. First reason is C++ type also involves object representation. This is the bit that I got uncomfortable with at the beginning, comparing and contrasting objects and values. So for example, boost offset putter um, represents a pointer value uh, not, not as the literal bits of a pointer, but as the bits representing the integer difference between the pointer I'm representing and my own address. So it represents it as an offset from this. Um, and this means that if you copy this value from here to somewhere else, uh, its actual bitwise representation is going to change. It's going to be different in these two places. Um, we would say that it's not trivially relocatable. Come to my talk tomorrow. Um, so um, uh, Bob Stiegel's uh, synthetic pointers, which he's going to talk about tomorrow. So go to his talk as well. Um, also have the same uh, basic design of, of same range of values, different shuffling up of the bits. Um, and so yeah, C++ conflates valuation and object, object-ish attributes. Um, and it might have been better somehow, philosophically, I can't quite wrap my head around this, but to somehow have a pointer representation type and the pointer value type separately so that I can manipulate pointer values up here in value space and copy them around and whatnot. And then only when I go to write them into memory and give them an address, I use the object representation. And on that, I set the value or I get the value. And I don't use operator equal and, and copy construction, all these other things that really feel slightly different from what I'm doing when I'm putting these bits into memory. But of course, that's one of the great strengths of C++ is that it conflates them so seductively that you don't even notice until you get into this stuff and you're like, oh wait, how did, how did this ever work? Um, the other idea I thought of, so object representation, the other possibility for a fancy pointer not being just a native pointer is that it could be augmented with extra data. Um, so it could be not just a native pointer, but also some more stuff, uh, such as metadata uh, used by the deallocator. Um, I've called these segmented pointers. I know that's a bad name, but I can't think of a better one. And we're not going to like shed that one right now. Um, but it could contain something like, hey, deallocator, when you go to deallocate this pointer, I know it came from this slab, so go use that one. Um, the deallocator might not even work without that metadata. Um, uh, fat pointers could carry metadata used during dereferences, like array bounds. They could catch, uh, you know, if you do an addition and it takes you outside the range of the array, it could, uh, it could trap on that. Um, these are neat ideas. Uh, I believe they are intended to work with boost container. Uh, they work only inconsistently or accidentally with the actual SDL. Uh, different vendors, different containers have different levels of support for these. Um, and so it, it's not even like, a you know, use libs did C++ or use libc++ or they all get things wrong. They just get different subsets of them wrong. Um, and I would love to see this be supported by the standard. Um, but mostly for philosophical reasons. Um, just I, I would like to see the pointer values carried through rather than constantly being cast to native pointers and back because that loses you information such as array bounds, uh, such as uh, metadata used by the deallocator. Um, so uh, a C++ allocator, uh, so a, 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 a fancy pointer is not just a native pointer, it's also this other stuff. And uh, a C++ allocator is not just a handle to a memory resource, but it is also the decider of how pointers are represented in the pointer type. And it is also, uh, we're not going to talk about this much, but uh, the uh, decider of whether the source of memory uh, should move with the container value or stick to the original container object. Because remember, we had two ways of looking at containers. A container could be viewed as a value containing subvalues or as an object managing subobjects. Um, and so uh, there are a bunch of member type defs in allocator traits, uh, which it gets from the allocator type, um, which are colloquially called PACA, PACMA, and POX, uh, which stands for propagate on container copy out assignment, propagate on container move assignment, and propagate on container swap. Um, those are their full names with underscores. Um, they're crazy long, and that is why they have colloquial names. Um, so Bob, if I'm not mistaken, and this is where you should correct me if I get this wrong, um, but you call this lateral propagation of, of I'm taking a, 
a vector with a certain allocator, assigning it to a vector with a different allocator. Does my allocator propagate over to this across the assignment, or do I just copy over all of the elements right. and use the same allocator on this side? That's what it's called, but it's not my name. Ah, whose name do you think it is? People smarter than me came up with that. Someone smarter than Bob came up with it. Well, that, that narrows it down, right? Um, um, I call it stickiness. I, I don't like this propagation thing. I, I call it uh, stickiness. When, you, when you're assigning over this, do, do we, does the original allocator get replaced, or does it, get, does it just stick with the allocator it had? Um, and you might want this if you're treating your containers as objects. This container, this vector, is actually going to live right here. Here's the buffer it uses. I never want it to, I never want its data pointer to point somewhere else, because that's just going to confuse the heck out of me. I always want its data pointer to point right into this, this buffer it has right next to it. Um, in that case, I make it sticky. And I set that on the allocator type, not on the allocator value. I can't do that at runtime, but I can set it at compile time on the allocator type to say this will be sticky. Polymorphic allocator is sticky by default. Uh, std allocator and all other stateless allocators are non-sticky by default. Um, although copying a stateless allocator shouldn't change anything, so I'm not actually sure why they need to be non-sticky. Um, and then the last thing is uh, a superfluous allocator is also the decider of how containers, sub-objects, or elements should be constructed. Um, it has a member function construct and destroy. Um, construct is always called whenever we're trying to construct an object. So basically, instead of places where you would normally just think, oh, well, placement knew something, uh, using the allocator model, you actually have to delegate that to the allocator and say, hey, allocator, how would you like to placement new this thing? And then when you destroy it, you have to say, hey, allocator, how would you like to arrow tilde this thing? Um, and the allocator generally says, yeah, I'm going to placement new it. I'm going to tilde delete it. I'm, you know, uh, I'm not going to do anything fancy. Um, but there is an example in the standard of someone doing something fancy, and that is scoped allocator adapter, uh, which actually passes itself down, or passes a sub-object of itself down to the placement new um, so that it can sort of propagate itself down into the elements of something and make sure that all the elements are using the same allocator. Um, and uh, Bob, I think you call, I'm not sure about this one, vertical propagation, is that right? Yes, I think that's Pablo's term for it. Pablo Halpern's term, probably. Um, that uh, it's propagating down into all of the elements. Um, I don't have a nice name for this one. Uh, I just call it scoped allocator adapter is why we can't have nice things. Um, and uh, particularly the scoped allocator adapter is the one thing that overrides uh, construct and destroy. Um, and uh, if your container doesn't know how construct and destroy behave, then it can't optimize through them, um, even if all they're doing is a trivial destructor call, for example. Uh, so my other talk, uh, slide 26 in my talk tomorrow morning, uh, has trivial construct and destroy. Um, I would like to see that come to allocator traits. That might be cool. Uh, but it's only cool because it enables other things that might not be coming. So. Um, all right, so it is a handle to a heap, the very first thing. It's a runtime source of memory, handle to a heap, plus some orthogonal pieces. Um, so it's not just a handle. Um, now, we might say that the orthogonal bits, all of these compile time things, and then I don't know if I want to call that last one runtime or compile time. It's more runtime than the other things. Um, but we might say that all of these grayed out things are just artifacts of the C++ type unrelated to the value of the allocator. The value of the allocator is still the name of a memory resource, the identifier of a memory resource, the address of a memory resource. But there's all this other stuff that's sort of artifacts of how C++ constructs types. Um, and so these are, these are all artifacts of the type. They're unrelated to the value. That suggests maybe we should have a way to convert uh, not just within a rebindable family, but maybe to even convert an allocator of one family to an allocator of a different family as long as they have the same value in some sense. Um, and maybe that's useful. I'm not sure. You could imagine um, a non-sticky uh, polymorphic allocator um, that worked just like polymorphic allocator. It was still a pointer to a memory resource, but it did propagate on uh, assignment. And uh, there is probably a good pragmatic reason for why that's not in the standard, probably because one was seen as more useful than the other. Um, it's extremely dangerous to propagate an allocator outside of a scope. Because the whole point being to create an allocator, right afterwards you create something that uses it. Now imagine if you were to assign something outside of that stack trait, 
it's a dangling pointer waiting to happen. So that's the reason for sure, just right off the bat. You know, that, that's, a, that's a very dangerous thing to have happen. And I think in general, if you think of an allocator like a B table as a part of the type of the object, it's part of its runtime type, and that doesn't change ever. It's just, it's just not resonant within the object. It is a pointer to something else that is shared. You say an, an object's uh, source of memory should not change over its lifetime, or else you're going to have dangling pointer bugs and all kinds of bad stuff and, and is correlated with that. Type. Think of it like a V-table. Yeah. Uh, think of it like a V-table pointer. Um, yeah. Um, I think that that is generally true. Uh, Although I think in your case, you're specifically thinking about uh, like stack buffers, where I have a trivial memory resource on the stack, and I allocate out of that buffer. And if, if that escapes, then obviously I have a dangling pointer, and I have a bug. Um, and that is the, the most useful and probably most common example of, of how you would use one. for example, are used exactly in that case. And right. if you propagated with monotonic allocators, the world would end immediately. Right, but we can think of memory resources that aren't a uh, monotonic buffer allocator that are like a thread local allocator where I know I'm going to deallocate it on the same thread eventually, but I'm going to let the value go around, pass by value, return by value, come back to me. Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, definitely there are reasons you wouldn't want that, but there might be a case in which you would. In that case, you could write an allocator adapter um, that would uh, change PACA and PACMA, and it would not affect uh, the value, the source of memory, and then you could like take your allocator and cast it back and forth, and all that. I don't know. Um, you could make a fancy allocator adapter that wrapped around a native pointer adapter and, and turned all of its pointers into uh, fancy pointers for bounds checking or some other reason. Um, you could do this with offset putter, but that would be a horrible idea and wouldn't work. Um, and I don't use it very much, so I'm not going to get into that. But it's not as useful as it looks right off the bat. Uh, grafting fat pointers onto an arbitrary heap, fat pointers being the things you could do bounds checking on. Uh, that sounds more useful. Um, and I am running out of time, which is great. Um, how are analogous handle types handled in other areas of C++? Um, so I'm saying an allocator is a handle to a heap, or an allocator is a handle to a memory resource. Um, notice the lack of underscore in memory resource. I'm not talking about the concrete uh, virtual type. I'm talking about the, the concept of memory resource. Um, so an allocator is a cheaply copyable handle to a memory resource plus some other bits. Um, an iterator is a cheaply copyable handle to the contents of a container in some sense. That one's a little bit weird. Um, and it has some other bits, such as the direction that it goes when you plus plus it, reverse iterator. It can switch that direction. It's an iterator adapter um, um, that just changes one little thing about the type while leaving everything else the same. Um, by the way, my uh, synopsis promised that I was going to explain the difference between facade and adapter. Um, I don't know how well I did it, um, but at least in Boost's case, uh, they use facade to mean uh, there is some simpler set of primitives. I'm just going to implement those primitives, and I'm going to get everything else from the facade. The facade is just going to sit in front of my implementation, which is very small, and it's going to provide postfix operator plus plus and you know, things like that. Um, and then the iterator adapter means I'm adapting some other type. I'm going to keep an instance of, itself, of it within myself. And I'm just going to over. I'm going to delegate most things to it and override certain things. So that's like uh, a reverse iterator is an example of an adapter. And also these adapt the adapters in the previous slide. Um, we're now well into the speculative part of this talk, by the way. Um, so uh, PO443 is a proposal for executors. Um, it's on revision five at the moment. Uh, and in that proposal, an executor is a copyable, I'm assuming cheaply copyable, handle to an execution context, uh, plus some other bits. Um, PO443 says uh, there is an execution context associated with the executor. Uh, so an executor is, is something, it's a, a source of uh, execution resources, uh, such as you might pass to std async. Right? Async does something asynchronously probably on a thread, doesn't really tell you. There's no way to control where it gets the thread from. Uh, executors are going to be the answer to where you get these threads, and if they are threads to begin with. Um, so an execution context is the equivalent of a memory resource in, in this. A memory resource hands out chunks of memory. Uh, an execution context will hand out execution resources and execution agents. 
Um, so the execution agents are kind of like chunks of memory. They're, they're units of execution. They're getting handed out. Um, and the execution context is a program object. It is object-like. It's just going to sit in one place, maybe not physically in one memory address. It might not even have a memory address. It, it's a thing that lives out there conceptually in one place. And the executor is more like a value type that gets passed around, maybe copied, um, and refers to the execution context and delegates to it whenever it needs something, like to spawn a new thread. Uh, and just like uh, monotonic buffer, which we talk a little bit about here, there's also something like a static thread pool proposed to be coming to the executor's library. Um, just one simple execution context to sort of give you the idea of what you can do um, without necessarily being a good solution for your particular case. Um, and there's also one type uh, which models executor, um, the executor concept, which is this value type. Um, std executor uh, is an executor that can point to any execution context anywhere, or hold any executor at all. Uh, and so it's polymorphic actually more in the sense of std function or std any, as opposed to the thing with polymorphic in its name. The one thing with polymorphic in its name is less polymorphic than all of these other type erase things like std function, std any, and std executor. Um, polymorphic allocator holds a very concrete pointer to a memory underscore resource, uh, which is polymorphic in the classical OO sense, um, but not polymorphic in the type erasure sense. Um, you could imagine drawing up something like a, a truly polymorphic allocator that can hold any allocator at all. Um, uh, or in this case, what am I doing? Shared pointer to memory resource. That should say shared pointer to, oh no, that's right. Uh, right, and the reason that's right is that we have this thing called resource adapter right here that's in the library fundamentals TS, somehow got left out of 17, but if we had it in, you could do things like this, um, where I'm taking an arbitrary allocator, I am wrapping it up in a resource adapter that actually creates a new memory resource that sits in one place and exposes the memory resource facade and uh, delegates everything to that allocator. And then I wrap that up and I do my usual type erasure thing and I delegate everything here. I have now an executor style allocator. When you call allocate, that delegates to my memory resource, uh, which delegates to the alloc that sits inside it, uh, which does whatever that allocator does. Uh, why not just use the original memory resource? Why not use the original? Um, well, there may not be a memory resource at all. Um, oh, really? Alloc here doesn't need to be a polymorphic allocator with a resource pren pren method. Right. Um, I'm actually delegating like three levels here. Uh, and I see we're almost out of time. I, I promised this to, I heard a rumor that you could uh, basically using weak putters uh, have some sort of sense in which you're like, I'm shutting down now, the heap might have already gone away, just please don't allocate anything uh, or deallocate anything. This strikes me as a recipe for dangling pointers, and I don't recommend it. But I've heard that someone somewhere has something that works kind of like this, and I would maybe be interested in you tell me what I got wrong afterward. Uh, you could also do something like a shutdown quick allocator, where the only difference is uh, if the global boolean shutting down now, then just don't bother deallocating anything. Again, seems like a terrible idea. Don't please don't do this, or if you do do it, do it right, and then tell me about it. And with that, we're at questions, and we've got 29 minutes left. That's great. No, we have 29 minutes until the break, or until the end of the break. So, um, thank you. Questions.